Hey friends, welcome into Cross My Heart Ministry. Lauren McFarland here. Thanks for visiting us today. We've had some weather issues here in Northwest Arkansas. So I'm recording this week's teaching lecture from home, but it's the same teaching that I would have if I was out at camp with a dining hall full of women. We're landing in 2 Corinthians 8 this week in the Word of God, and I've titled this lesson, The Grace of Giving, Releasing, and Receiving. You're going to see a picture of me floating in the Dead Sea. We're going to have a little bit of a geography lesson as we talk about where the ancient kingdom of Macedonia is, that, that country, that people way back in the day. We're going to look at how they were held up as an example by Paul as he was writing to the Corinthians, but talking about the Macedonians. So all that and, and more is going to be in this week's teaching lecture, and I hope you'll stay tuned and listen to all of it. For Cross My Heart Ministry, I'm Laura McFarland. In the spring of 2022, I was blessed to fulfill one of my lifelong, lifetime desires of my heart, and that is to visit the Holy Land. One of the sites that we explored was the Dead Sea, and I'm pictured here on the screen with my dear friend Kathy and, and her sister Denise, who's also my friend, who was in the group tour with us as well. The high salt content of the Dead Sea makes it possible to float just by sitting back as if you were sitting down into a chair. You can see our hands and feet up in the photo here and just to confirm there are no floaties under us. There's no flotation de device whatsoever. We're just leaning back and holding up our hands and feet and the water keeps us afloat. According to Wikipedia, the Dead Sea is 9.6 times saltier than the ocean. And all that salt is not only the reason that we could float, it's also the reason and that the Dead Sea has its name, Dead Sea. Because of all that salt, fish can't live there and plants can't flourish there. You can't swim in it and boats don't sail in it. But tourists like Kathy and Denise and me sure did enjoy floating in it. The map helps depict the reason, this map helps depict the reason for all that saltiness. You see on the screen the Sea of Galilee up to the north, and that was of course the setting for much of Jesus' ministry. You've heard about the Sea of Galilee recorded in the Gospels. So the Jordan River flows from the north, continues, flows out to the south, into the Dead Sea. So the Sea of Galilee has water flowing in and water flowing out. But unlike the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea has no outlet. Fresh water flows in, but no water flows out. The fresh water is evaporated by the sun, leaving a very salty body of water where nothing can flourish. A healthy body of water has both an inflow and an outflow. That rhythm and movement brings life. And it's a great analogy for our lives as grace-filled believers. As God, by His grace, allows blessings to flow into us and into our lives, there should be a corresponding outflow as we release the blessings that He has poured into us. Healthy, growing believers see themselves as conduits of God's grace, His truth, His gifts, and His love. What we receive, everything we receive, comes to us by the grace of God, and by His grace, we are also blessed to receive it. In this week's text, in 2 Corinthians 8, Paul challenges the Corinthians to excel in the grace of giving. Now, that's maybe a new phrase for some of us, the grace of giving. I'm going to listen for that phrase as I read this week's text, and I invite you to stand with me in honor of the Word of God, as is always our custom. I'll be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. And now, brothers... We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do so as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. 
So we urge Titus, since he had earlier ma made a beginning, to bring to also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Ladies, thank you for standing in honor of God's holy word. Would you pray with me? Father God, let us lean into this passage. Show us, stir our hearts. Holy Spirit, convict us individually. Meet us right where we are. Show us what the grace of giving means. And Father, for each woman listening, I just pray that after hearing this message, hearing truth from your word, from your holy gospel, Father, from the words of the New Testament, your word, that each of us would prayerfully consider how we need to respond, how we need to not just be knowers of your truth, but doers of it. Give us a Holy Spirit inspired assignment and show us how we can learn, not only learn about, but practice this grace of giving in your name and for your glory, I pray Jesus, amen. Well, Paul challenges the Corinthians in verse seven, but since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. He affirmed them in so many areas of things that they did well. And then he issues this challenge regarding the grace of giving. This, this is an interesting phrase to describe his challenge to the Corinthians, the grace of giving. Maybe it's a new phrase for you. Maybe that's a new idea? Have you ever considered giving to be prompted by or to empowered by grace? Appeals to give or motives to give might be powered or fueled by all sorts of different motivations. They might be characterized by guilt, obligation, legalism. And, and I got to tell you that sometimes if you're like me, sermons that are pushing me to give by, by guilt or motivation such as that, by shaming me or, or prodding or feeling like I'm being poked, those actually make me less motivated to give rather than more motivated. But Paul tells us that rather than guilt or obligation or, or some sort of legalistic approach, he tells us that our giving should be motivated by grace. Paul adopts grace over guilt when it comes to giving. Paul holds up the Macedonian believers as an example for us, and that may lead you to ask, well, who are the Macedonians? Macedonia is in the northern region of Greece. Uh, Corinth is in Achaia, the southern region of Greece. And so both Macedonia and Corinth have coastlines on the Aegean Sea. So if you are watching the video, this might be a good time to push pause and just grab an atlas or a map to sort of get that settled in your mind where they are. So Paul had established these churches in Macedonia, specifically Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea on his second missionary journey. And Paul's missionary method echoes that, that Jesus laid out for us in the Great Commission. He wasn't just about making converts. He was making disciples. And so he would go and plant those churches. He would win souls in the areas that he visited. But then he would go back and visit them again. He wrote them letters. He sent his helpers like Titus and Timothy to go and invest in them. He prayed for them. Paul was committed to making disciples and continuing to encourage those that he led to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 8, 1, Paul reminded us that the Macedonians had received grace from God. And that might seem an odd thing to read at first. Well, of course they received the grace of God, you might say, because all believers received the grace of God, right? That, that's, that's the gospel message. It's by grace you are saved through faith. And so, of course, they received the grace of God. But I think Paul has a, a reason for dropping that reminder in right there at the beginning before he went on to introduce the Macedonians and tell a little bit more about them to the Corinthians who, who were receiving this letter. Verse 2, after mentioning their grace, verse 2, he tells the Corinthians that the Macedonians are impoverished and that they had faced severe trials. I think Paul mentioned the grace of God in verse 1 to remind us of how it is possible to survive and even thrive in poverty and hardship spiritually, even if we're physically impoverished and, and facing difficult times. 
but it's only possible by the grace of God. He wanted us to see those two concepts together, the grace of God, but yet they're suffering. And so the suffering of the Macedonian scholars tell us was most likely the result of their faith in Christ. That being a Christian, most likely in that culture and in that society, in that city, meant most likely a job loss, economic hardship, and, and suffering for the Macedonian believers. It came at the hands of the Jews as well as the Roman oppressors. Their persecution would have impacted them economically and politically, making them a target for the Jews who rejected Jesus and so oppressed them because of their, their belief in Jesus, because the, the Jews had set themselves up against the, our Lord Jesus, and then also against the Romans who ruled them and oppress them. So it was a challenging time and place in history for these Macedonian believers. If you were a follower of Jesus Christ in that culture and in that time, it really cost you something. So let's keep their suffering and their hardship and their economic status in mind as we study Paul's call to the Corinthians and by extension us to excel in this grace of giving. There's our phrase again. What does the grace of giving look like lived out? Well, we're going to spend our time today exploring the grace of giving and specifically how it was lived out in the lives of these Macedonian believers. And so what can we learn from them? First of all, for the grace of giving means generosity. They were generous, it tells us in verse 2. Paul describes the Macedonians as generous. He says this, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Do you see the contrast? Severe, severe trial and extreme poverty and yet overflowing joy and rich generosity. What a contrast, what a contrast that they can have on one hand, this severe trial and extreme poverty, but yet it overflows in rich generosity. Verse three goes on to say that they gave as much as they were able and quote, beyond their ability. This is illogical from a human standpoint, but it's what happens when God's grace overflows. It's the upside down logic of the gospel that we've seen over and over again in second Corinthians. It's even what we've titled this particular study, the upside down logic of the gospel. Verse four says this, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord. Lord's people. The Macedonians were not reluctant or shy about giving. They certainly did not use their extreme poverty or their severe trials as an excuse not to give. Just the opposite. The, the scripture tells us that they urgently pleaded to be able to give. Now there are three key words in this verse for us to examine. I want you to get this. I thought it was so eye-opening as I did the research to explore this. They urgently pleaded, and then these are the three words I want to look at. Privilege, sharing, and service. They urgently pre pleaded for the privilege of sharing in this service. So first of all, privilege. The word translated privilege in our English text it, from the Greek is the word charis. And charis, my friends, as you probably know, means grace. How cool is that? We look at them and marvel that they would give from a place of poverty and suffering, but they didn't see themselves as martyrs making a sacrifice. They saw their giving as an overflow of God's grace. The Macedonian mindset was, God has given us so much by his grace. We want to give. We want to release what we have received. This is the grace of giving. This is the grace of giving. They urgently pleaded for the privilege or grace of sharing. And the next word, sharing, the word translated sharing is koinonia. And you may know that one as well. You may recognize it. Koinonia in the Greek means, means fellowship. It can also be translated fellowship. Here it's translated sharing but it can also mean fellowship. So the Macedonians, well, they had not met the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. They didn't know them personally, but their giving would knit their hearts together with their Jewish brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, not unlike how our hearts get knitted together with brothers and sisters around the world as we share our resources so that the missional effort can go out around the world. It's the same idea. Their hearts were most likely softened as they heard about the suffering that the Jews in Jerusalem were experiencing. They also most likely felt no small degree of gratitude for the Jews because it was through the lineage of the Jewish people that our Lord Jesus Christ came. And so 
Christians that they were, they felt a debt of gratitude to their Jewish brothers and sisters. So God uses the sharing of our gifts to create unity in the body of Christ. This is the grace of giving. And then finally, the third word is service. The Macedonians urgently pleaded for the privilege of sharing in the service of the Lord. The word for service here is diakonia. And as you may have guessed, it's where we get the word deacon. And so the deacons within our body, in our local churches, they serve the body of Christ. But we are all called to serve one another where we are ordained as deacons or not. Galatians 5.13 says, serve one another humbly in love. Of course, our ultimate example of service is, is our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to have the spiritual gift of giving to be called upon to give. And we look to the example of Jesus. It's a powerful example. The king who became a servant. It's another example of the upside down logic of the gospel. He took off his robe of glory. He set it aside. He put on human flesh, and he came to earth to seek and save and to serve. Paul reminded them of this in verse 9. What a powerful, powerful reminder here. Paul says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus left heaven to become what we are, so that we could receive what he has. He became poor spiritually so that we could become spiritually rich. He was the king who became a servant. Scripture describes him as a suffering servant. So you can go back and read that prophecy in Isaiah 53. Other than the cross, the ultimate act of service that comes to mind for me when I think about Jesus serving is the Lord's Supper, the night before the cross. That last night in the upper room before he faced that horrific crucifixion to pay for your sin and my sin. They had all gathered for a meal. They had crusty, dirty feet. Remember, they walked everywhere. They wore sandals. The roads were dusty. Nothing was paved. And so the Middle East dust would collect. It would be carried inside. It would get caked on their feet. And in John 13, we learn that our Lord Jesus Christ got up he tied, uh, took a towel and a, and a pitcher of water, and he systematically washed 12 pairs of feet. 12. 12. The creator of the universe, the son of God Almighty, the one who spoke the world into existence, who was present at creation, humbled himself to get down on his hands and knees to wash the dirty, smelly feet of 12 stinky teenage boys. And we must boys when they've been outside there was no air conditioning so let's and let's also remember Jesus washed 12 pairs of feet he even washed the feet of G, of Judas knowing that Judas was going to betray him knowing what was in his heart this was a picture of service Jesus finished and then here's what he said to them I'm going to read from John 13 12 B through 17 these are powerful words from our Lord do you understand what I've done for you he asked them you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You will be blessed if you do them. If Jesus would condescend to wash stinky, dirty feet, then there's no job, no task, no assignment that should be beneath us. This passage should challenge us to lean into praying in, to asking ourselves, where am I being called to serve? What job have I deemed beneath me? And who have I written off as not worthy of my gifts? If Jesus would wash the, the feet of Judas, then there's no one that is beyond being an object of, of being a recipient for God's grace, the service that his grace would overflow through me to them. And look at the blessing that comes. Jesus reminds us that now that we know these things, 
we will be blessed if we do them. Blessing always rolls back to us when we obey our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus chose to serve by doing a stinky, smelly job. The Son of God was on his knees before dirty teenage boys, including one with a heart of betrayal. He set an example for us of what it means to serve. And he told us that blessing comes when we follow his example. This is service. This is a picture of what service looks like lived out. The Macedonians saw their giving as an act of service, releasing a gift with nothing expected from the recipient in return. This is the grace of giving. Paul encouraged the Corinthians to excel in the grace of giving, and he held up the Macedonians as an example of what this looks like. The Macedonians urgently pleaded for the privilege of sharing in the service of the Lord. They were experiencing extreme trials and severe poverty, but yet joy welled up and they demonstrated generosity, rich generosity, it says in verse 2. They refused to allow their circumstances to be either an excuse or an explanation for not giving. Their example should simultaneously convict you and me as well as spur us on. And here's our truth. The woman of God excels in the grace of giving. This is the lesson we learned from the Macedonians. This is the challenge that Paul issued to the Corinthians and also to us. But how were they able to do it? They, they lived under Roman oppression. They were living in poverty and they were suffering severe trials and yet they gave. They urgently pleaded for the privilege of sharing in this service. And how is this possible? How could they live with such suffering and uncertainty and still give away the resources that would have helped them survive? Well, the answer, sister friends, is found in verse 5. This is the key to the whole thing. Read, read this with me. Study this with me. Accept this. Treasure this. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. They gave themselves first to the Lord. Giving should not be dictated by the size of our bank account or the absence of conflict in our lives. We should not look outwardly, horizontally to decide if or how much to give. Rather, we look up. We look up. Like the Macedonians, we look to the Lord. So we need to be convicted to ask ourselves, where do I look for my security? Where or to whom brings me peace? Where do I look for my provision? Is it the bank account, your bank account that brings you peace or, or brings me peace? Do we look at our year in investments? Are those year in reports, does that bring us reassurance? Oh, we're on track to be able to retire when we need to or to save enough money to send the kids to college or, or, or to take a nice vacation next summer. Does that bring us peace? If so, then if you're looking at, at your stock market account, then if, if there's some weather or political event on the other side of the world that causes the stock market to fall, well, that, that event way over there, some typhoon out in the Pacific Ocean, that's going to rob you of your peace living here in America. How about maybe what you do to find peace and to reassure yourself is you tally up the hours that you've served in, a, in your church or your nonprofit, and that brings you peace and reassurance. For the woman of God, releasing our time and our treasure is a complete work of grace. It's grace. We look first to the Lord. We acknowledge that all we have and all we are is the result of His provision. We have nothing that we did not receive as a gift from Him. We are only stewards. What we have to release is not ours. It was given to us. The question is, what will we do with what we've been given? When we look to the Lord first, pride evaporates. The fear of releasing our financial security goes away because we realize that our real, lasting, eternal security, well, that's, that's found in Jesus alone. Joy will begin to well up. Gratefulness. We know our hope for now on this day, as well as our hope for eternity, has nothing to do with who sits on the throne in Rome or who resides in the White House in 21st century America, or whether or not there's an earthquake or a tornado or a typhoon, or if the biopsy is positive, or if the car insurance goes up. All that really matters is that Jesus died on the cross, and now he sits at the right hand of God. He died for you and me. Death could not hold him. He is in heaven now, and he's coming back for us. He's coming back. If your security and my security is found solely in the person of Jesus Christ, then may we be, be women who every single day 
choose to give ourselves first to the Lord. We make the decision last week and last month and yesterday, and today's a brand new day to look to the Lord, to give myself first to Him. And then if we've done that, it will be a natural outflow to excel in the grace of giving, to release all that He has given to us prayerfully and Holy Spirit empowered and is unto the Lord. If we're not releasing our time and our treasure, if we have no interest in that, then perhaps it's not really so much a giving problem that we have, but a relationship problem. Are we holding out or holding back? Have you and I given ourselves fully to the Lord? Are we all in? Do we sort of have our fire insurance and we pray to prayer for salvation, but we're not really calling him our Lord and giving him access to every nook and cranny of our hearts and our lives, full access. The, is he truly our Lord, the Lord of our time and the Lord of our resources, the Lord of our now as well as the Lord of our eternity. Perhaps it's a thankfulness problem. Do we need to remind ourselves that, that all we have came from Him, and so therefore it's all the result of His grace? As we wrap up, I want to leave you with the challenge. Be like the Macedonians. Give yourself to the Lord first. Give Him the first part of your day. Give Him the first part of your resources. Give Him your best first self. When we give to the Lord first, it's a statement of faith that there'll be enough left to make it to the end of the month or to make it all the way to retirement, to meet all the bills, to meet all the obligations. This first things first mindset is a statement of faith in itself. January is a great time to make this kind of commitment, to choose to be all in, no shirking, no holding back. So I encourage you, take some time this week to open your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the passage that, that we're studying today, the verses that I read as we began today. Read Paul's words to the Corinthians. Read them carefully, read them slowly, and read them prayerfully. Take some time to, to really study those verses and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal some truth to you. And then I encourage you to pick up two things. Your checkbook and your calendar, your checkbook and your calendar, because these two things represent our greatest treasures on earth for many of us, our greatest resources, our, our money and our time. Those are two things that we are limited by, two things that we want to hold on to, two things that we can be very selfish and greedy with, our time and our money. But as you read 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and you grab these two things and pray. Ask the Lord to enable and empower you. Look to Him and ask Him to show you how you can excel in the grace of giving. What's your best next step to do just that? Let's remind ourselves to believe, to truly believe what we already believe, what Paul reminds us of in verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Let's choose to live our lives, not as if we were dead, but alive in Christ, looking to him to keep us afloat in the struggles that this life brings. There's nothing that we can do to keep ourselves from sinking spiritually or financially or physically or relationally. Hard things and difficult circumstances may come, but may we be women who simply lean into his grace and trust Him to provide all the way in it and through it. May we become women who look to the Lord for our security on earth as well as for our eternal security. And as His grace flows in, may we acknowledge His provision and then excel in the grace of giving, allowing what He has provided to flow through us and then to lean into the privilege of sharing in this service to others. And let's do it all for His glory, all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's thank Him now for the privilege of sharing in His service to others. And let's ask Jesus to show us how to excel in the grace of giving or how to move one notch up to a greater and deeper capacity in releasing what He has, has poured into us in this coming year, all in His name and all for His glory. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank You for for this challenging teaching in Scripture. Thank you for pushing us in areas that convict us and shape us and change us. We want to live 
all in for you. We want to be women of God who lean in to obeying you in all areas and don't hold anything back. Thank you for this word that Paul had for the Corinthians that's so applicable to us today. Thank you for the amazing example of the Macedonians in the first century that so convicts us as women in the 21st century. Show us even this week, Father, how as we look to you first and we give ourselves to you first, how we can then be women who pry our fingers off of our checkbook and off of our time, off of our calendar, and release what we have received to you. Show us how we can excel in the grace of giving. Give us an assignment. We pray that our decisions that we make, how we choose to Use the resources that you have given to us would bring honor and glory to you. Let us be women who are alive in Christ, women who do not receive and then just hold on to it like the waters of the Dead Sea. Let us have a rhythm of letting things flow in and flow out because we acknowledge that all we have and all we are comes from your hand. It's all your grace and it's all to be used to make much of you. We pray this in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.